Okay, so the defendant's been arraigned on this. He has the plea offer. The offer, as I understand it, is rejected. And there will be a motion to suppress uh, to follow um, here. Okay, is there anything else anybody wants to discuss before we get to argument on the motion to reopen detention? Sure. No, you're good? Okay. Yeah. Ms. Robeson, anything you need to address before we get to the argument? No, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Um, in this matter, we do have before the court today a motion to reopen the detention hearing. It was filed by Ms. Ward um, on, on or about March 31 of 2020. I've had the opportunity to review Ms. Ward's brief and um, the very substantial um, appendix of exhibits which was associated with the brief submitted its brief. I think their brief was on or about April 9 of 2020. And I've also had the opportunity to review the, um, I think it was one certification that of Warden Charles Ellis that was submitted with that. Um, we're ready for oral argument now. Um, I have reviewed everything and I say that just so the record is clear that I have not because I'm trying to limit anybody's oral argument. Take as much time as you would like. Ms. Ward, it's your motion. I'll hear from you first, please. Thank you, Judge. As Your Honor indicated, I did file a letter memorandum um, uh, dated March 31st. Put a lot of thought, time, and effort into it. Um, it's rather extensive, and, and I'm confident the court had the opportunity to review it, as Your Honor indicated. Um, since the writing of the brief, the statistics, as we all know, have, have tripled as far as the uh, known cases of COVID-19 and the known deaths related to COVID-19. In addition, I believe since the filing of Warden Ellis's certification, um, the number of COVID uh, virus uh, patients uh, in the jail has also increased. Upon information and belief, I believe there's more than one correction officer that has COVID-19. And um, the uh, many more correction officers are, in fact, in quarantine as a result of that. And I do believe there was um, an inmate or two that had it but was released. Um, but unfortunately, it was within the last 14 days that we, the uh, the effect as to whether or not the virus spread throughout the jail um, is not exactly known at the present time. That being said, Judge, um, you know, I, 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 I've been making these arguments throughout the state, and I am embarrassed to say that I had a lack of knowledge as to the lack of sanitary conditions in the jail. I just assumed that um, their clothing and their underwear um, were laundered and washed on a more frequent or regular basis than they are, for example. Um, the orange jumpsuit you see my client wearing, he's given an orange jumpsuit once a week to change. So he wears the same jumpsuit for a whole week. His underwear underneath the orange jumpsuit, assuming he's wearing some, and I assume he is, um, he washes himself. It's the inmate's responsibility to do that. Um, they have limited sinks available to them. And in fact, some of my clients tell me they do it in their toilet. Uh, the hand sanitizers that the warden indicated in the certification, um, uh, I believe that they're non-alcohol related because of obvious reasons in the jail. And they're certainly not widely available in um, the uh, pods themselves. More importantly, Judge, we have these directives um, from the governor uh, as far as social distancing is concerned, six feet away. That is virtually impossible and does not happen in the county jail. It just can't. Um, the jails uh, without COVID-19 are breeding grounds for disease. They just are. And, you know, thankfully, we don't have a situation that they have up in Hudson right now. Um, but that could be a day away. We just don't know. And uh, what happens, an interesting argument has been made, is that what if this population of the jail does get infested, infected with COVID-19, they become very sick, where do they go? They have to go to the hospitals. They have to go to the emergency rooms. They have to go to ICU. Uh, and what? how do they go there? They don't go on their own. The correction officers now have to leave um, the jail and they have to wait with them outside their room, inside the different hospital facilities. And what do they do when they go to the jail? They're, uh, they're taking our ventilators, the, the street people's ventilators that, you know, unfortunately are in very limited supply. So when you take the argument with respect to protection of the public, which is what we usually have the Bail Reform Act, the, argue, the state is usually arguing 
um, the defendant needs to be detained for protection of the public. I think an interesting argument, reverse argument can be made that for the protection of the public, it is incumbent upon the trial courts to thin the populations of the jail for those that have uh, nonviolent offense offenders at the very least. Now, um, at, at the outset of this outbreak, I, I informally reached out to the court and the prosecutor uh, seeing if we can work this matter out. And the response was, you know, it's a gun charge. And therefore, the suggestion is that it's violent. The problem with that argument, Judge, is that the whole reason we have bail reform and the, the um, definitions for pretrial uh, services uh, and the safety assessment definitions do not include his charge as a violent offense. It is not a violent offense under the law, uh, under New Jersey's law. And it, it also, which we modeled after the federal system, it is not a violent offense um, for detention purposes uh, in the federal system. And that's uh, United States versus Bowers 432 F3D 518. And I think that's that's important. Felon in possession is not a violent crime for detention purposes. It just isn't. Um, there's no allegation or in, uh, suggestion he used it, attempted to use it, nothing like that. The poor man is driving a car that doesn't belong to him um, and is stopped for speeding. And now he's been incarcerated ever since. Now, um, his mother reached out to me this morning. And I don't know if, Mark, if you're aware of this. And if not, I apologize for, for letting you know this via uh, virtual uh, courtroom here, but um, your grandmother has been rushed to the hospital. She was a nursing home patient and she's been diagnosed with COVID-19 and she's on a ventilator right now. And his mother is beside himself. I'm sorry, herself. Um, and that was represented to me by Beverly this morning. And she really would like her son home to help her through this uh, situation, Your Honor. So, you know, we we have to step back and 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 think about why we're here uh, as far as bail reform. A couple years back, we would be posting bails, making sure the individuals would appear in court when required to do so. And if not, the bail bondsmen um, and the fugitive re their fugitive recovery people would go and bring them in. Um, but we've changed that by way of constitutional amendment, and we're here. And we the courts now have the ability to detain people endlessly. And I'm saying endlessly, although the statute says two years, because we, we've now... Um, have a moratorium of at least two months, possibly three, possibly four. United States versus Salerno, and I know I'm dating ourselves. Um, I think we're all, all three of us, unfortunately, are old enough to know when 1987 um, jurisprudence, and that's the United States Supreme Court case um, that they started, they challenged when the feds started doing this. And they said, wait a minute, you know, um, this is uh, detention, this pretrial detention constitutes punishment without trial. So the United States Supreme Court came down with Salerno, and, and what did they do? They said, no, it doesn't. And the reason why they said, no, it doesn't, is because they had a few, actually three separate and distinct reasons why. Um, the most uh, significant reason is that it indicated that the act operates only on individuals who have been arrested for particularly extremely serious offenses. I mean, that is how they justified it not being a violation of his Eighth Amendment right, punishment without trial, punishment without process, because they said, well, we have, it's regulatory and it's regulatory to protect against extremely serious offenses. And I think that's important because we have to step back and we have to look at when your honor's hearing all these motions to reopen and whether or not the fact that an individual who is presumed innocent is now being put in a situation where there's a breeding ground. They're doing the best they can, but it's a breeding ground, ground not just to get sick, not just to get a cold, but to get a cold and a virus that has been deadly not only throughout the state of New Jersey, not only throughout the United States, but throughout the entire population of this world. So you have the power, essentially, Your Honor, to determine whether or not Mr. Smith can be put in a situation where his life is less in danger than all of us. I mean, look look where you are, you're home. Look where Ms. Robinson is, she's home. We're six feet away from the next person. We're not allowed to go outside without masks. We can't shop. Um, everything's closed, businesses are closed, but where is he? I don't see a mask on him. He's, he's elbow to elbow with other individuals sleeping in his cell with very limited sanitary situations. And so I think we need to step back and regroup. I, I know the motions to reopen are supposed to be for limited situations, 
but you know, jurisprudence and case law changes and evolves over time. It does, and it over it, it needs to to move with the changes. And and the situation here is is potentially deadly for Mr. Smith. And um, this is this is what we have at the present time, Your Honor. So unless Your Honor has any other additional questions, um, my position is when you step back and you look at the whole purpose as far as Salerno, that it should be reserved for the uh, extremely serious offenses. This is not an extremely serious offense. And so he should not be detained, um, considering the fact that his life is potentially at risk. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ward. I appreciate your thoughtful argument. And I, again, thank you for um, the very high quality of the brief which you submitted. There was a lot of um, a very interesting reading material with that, and I appreciated the opportunity to review it. So thank you. Um, Robson, please. Yes, Your Honor. In addition to what we outlined in, in our brief, the state um, maintains that the defense has not um, offered any new information to justify reopening the detention under the rules that we have, rules that we're working under, under bail reform, and that are currently being um, utilized. He also has not put forth a compelling reason um, to justify the release. When you consider, in particular, that Judge Scully, um, and it was essentially confirmed by Judge um, Bingham, Judge Scully already had determined that the defendant was to be detained for the protection of the community. This is a defendant whose risk of failure to appear is the highest score you can get. It's a six. His risk of new criminal activity is a five, which is also quite high. Um, for an individual that's scoring a, a six and a five under those two categories, there's really little assurance or likelihood that that we could um, believe that he would follow any of the governor's directives should he be released. Um, I mean, certainly Ms. Lord and the judge and, and this prosecutor are following those directives, but someone who um, does not even follow a simple um, reporting for court to um, to earn a score of six on failure to appear is, is just not someone that you would expect would follow those directives. And in fact, may even be safer where he's at under the circumstances. Um, as far as the defense characterization of this not being a, a serious matter, not being a serious case, the state disagrees. It, it's an unlawful possession of a weapon case. The defendant um, was found to be driving around in the city with a loaded weapon at his side. And that that is a dangerous situation. We see, um, you know, what's been happening in Trenton, even um, even of late, some increase of violence. So to have this defendant out in the community when it's already been decided that um, he needed to be detained for the protection of the community uh, would is just not not the right um, right choice. Um, this defendant. Um, is not someone that was is not someone that's considered to be part of the high risk population. He's not elderly, um, as far as we know. There's no underlying condition that makes him particularly susceptible to or vulnerable to the virus. Um, not more so than anyone else. And those are the sort of people that have been released pending this um, this situation that we have in our country. People that are um, physically um, high risk, either elderly or have a condition and also who are presenting a low risk of harm to the community. He doesn't qualify under either of those. So for all those reasons, as well as those in the papers that were filed, um, the state is asking that this court deny his motion. Okay, um, I will note that in part of your argument, you mentioned things that are going on in Trenton right now is something the court should consider. I don't intend to consider what's going on in Trenton right now to the extent that I'm fully aware of it, even, and I, I don't know that I am. You know, I know what I read. I know some of the detention motions that are coming in, things like that. But I, I don't think that it's appropriate for me to look at other things that are happening and other people when I make the decision that I have to make in this case. So I just want the record to be clear that, well, I don't know if that's what you were really arguing. I'm not going to be looking into that aspect of things at all. Um, Ms. Ward, did you want to be heard as to any of Ms. Robeson's argument? Judge, it's, it's difficult at a detention hearing and a motion to reopen um, to make credibility arguments. But I, but since she's arguing that it's an extremely serious or dangerous offense, or you know, to counter my argument, I just want to say the following. Here's a gentleman who's driving down the road. He's supposedly speeding. The car, the car, his car doesn't stop instantly and, and the police fall from the sky. They put on their overhead lights. It takes a while. He pulls over. They get at, they call the stop in. They go approach the vehicle. 
and he's supposed to have a gun sitting there in plain view? I mean, if in fact, truly, that's how it happened, he's going, and he knew the gun was there, if it was even placed there by him, he's going to put it under the seat, he's going to hide it in the console, he's going to put it in the glove box. It just, it strains credibility, Judge. So I just offer that with respect to the this, this suggestion that it's an extremely serious crime, that he's driving down the city with a gun by his arm. Okay, well, I have read the um, statements of fact that are included in both briefs. I am familiar with that. I know what um, findings um, Judge Scully made and Judge Bingham made. Um, obviously, you know, I can't make any credibility findings um, relating to the officers. I don't have testimony left in reports or anything like that. So I certainly can't do that. Um, and I don't think any judge at any detention hearing heard testimony and made credibility findings. Um, perhaps there's a motion to suppress somewhere in this case. I, I don't know, but um, um, I th I'm confident that I understand the nature of the case. It is, you know, we, we see these types of cases um, from time to time, and I, I know what I've read here, and I, I certainly understand that. So, but I, I appreciate the tone of, of, of the additional argument that you made. So, um, everybody's good. Everybody's heard. Been yes, heard. Yes, thank you. The extent that they wish. Yes, okay, thank you. Intention. Um, to decide this matter um, right now. Um, by way of background, on or about March 10 of 2020, a Mercer County Grand Jury handed up number 20-03-0196, wherein defendant Mark Smith is charged as follows. Count one charges him with unlawful possession of a handgun, a second degree crime, specifically an XD tactical 40 caliber semi-automatic handgun. Count two charges him with possession of a large capacity ammunition magazine, a fourth degree crime. Count three charges possession of prohibited weapons or devices, specifically hollow point bullets, also a fourth degree crime. And count four charges certain persons not to possess a firearm. Um, that's a second degree crime. There's a co-defendant by the name of Yancey Young, Y-A-N-C-Y, who is not part of this motion. Mr. Young is charged in counts one through three, and Mr. Smith um, is charged alone in count four, the certain person's count. All offenses are alleged to have occurred on or about December 22, 2019 in the city of Trenton. The defendant appears to have been arrested on the crime date. He has been in custody since that date. The affidavit of probable cause supporting the warrant arrest is attached to the defendant's pleadings, and I've had the opportunity to review that, and I've heard some argument um, regarding this today. Um, the case involves a motor vehicle stop of a car driven by this defendant. The police observed the handgun, according to the affidavit of probable cause, wedged between the defendant's right thigh and the center console, protruding above the armrest. The police perceived the gun to have been accessible to both occupants of the vehicle, and the co-defendant, Mr. Young, had apparently attempted to get out of uh, the vehicle at or near the time when police approached the vehicle. I'm familiar with the public safety assessment, which was prepared um, for Mr. Smith, who is 30 years old with a date of birth of August 11, 1999. It recommended that he not be released. Um, he was an elevated risk score. He was a six on the FTA scale, a five on the NCA scale. There was no new violent criminal activity flag and the current offense was not considered violent. That is the gun possession or even the certain persons were not considered violent offenses. This defendant was not on pretrial monitoring at the time of this offense. He did have multiple pending disorderly persons offenses, six from two separate dates in 2010 and one from 2005. So these were um, older matters and I certainly consider that. The PSA did not show any prior disorderly person's convictions. The defendant was noted to have three prior indictable convictions from two separate sentencing dates. He had a third degree possession with intent that was sentenced on or about April 8, 2016 under case 14-1603. And he had a gun possession charge, second degree and a third degree school zone that were sentenced on July 21, 2010 under cases 083706 and 09714, respectively. None of the defendant's prior history is considered violent um, um, per the PSA. He had two failures to appear in the past two years 
and those were on the 2010 municipal matters, and he had 10 failures to appear, which were older than two years. And it appears from the PSA that uh, Mr. Smith has done two separate state prison terms. There was a detention hearing conducted in this matter on January 2 of 2020 before the Honorable Thomas F. Scully, JSC. The motion for pretrial detention was granted and defendant was detained. The basis for um, finding that, that Mr. Smith needed to be detained was both the risk that he would fail to appear and also the need to protect the safety of any other person or the community. Ms. Ward did not represent um, the defendant at this initial hearing, if my recollection is correct. Right. On or about February 28 of 2020, the defendant filed a motion to reopen detention. That motion was heard and denied by the Honorable Robert W. Bingham II, JSC, on March 11 of 2020. On or about March 31, 2020, the defendant filed a notice of motion to reopen the detention hearing. In support of this motion, the defendant submitted an 11-page brief with an extensive appendix, which included the following. I'm going to report it somewhat in summary form. Exhibit A was the complaint warrant. Exhibit B was the PSA. Exhibit C was the order granting um, pretrial detention. Exhibit D was the declaration of Chris Breyer, medical doctor and also a master in public health, I believe. He's an epidemiology professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Exhibit E is the declaration of Dr. Jonathan Lewis Golub, G-O-L-O-B, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Medicine. Exhibit F is the declaration of Robert B. Griffinger, G R. E-I-F-I-N-G-E-R, a medical doctor who has worked in healthcare with prisoners for over 30 years, including managing health care uh, for prisoners at Rikers Island for a period of time. Exhibit D is the declaration of Dr. Jamie Meyer, an assistant professor of medicine at Yale um, School of Medicine, and also an assistant clinical professor of nursing as well at the same institution, or affiliated with Yale anyway. Exhibit H is the declaration of Dr. Mark Stern, a specialist in correctional health care. Exhibit I is the order um, of the Supreme Court of New Jersey in connection with docket number 084230. This order is also known as the, the order issued in the matter of the request to commute or suspend county jail sentences. And it is also referred to in the pleadings as simply as the consent order. The Mercer County Prosecutor's Office filed a responsive brief on April 9, 2020. Included with the brief was the certification of Warden Charles Ellis of the Mercer County Correctional Center. And again, um, I said it at the beginning and I'd like to say it again, I'd like to commend counsel for the quality of the submissions. Um, the um, court benefited greatly from the effort you folks both put forth um, in preparing. Um, Mr. Smith was arraigned today. Um, we conferenced the case today and this motion is being heard and decided on um, today's date. The defendant makes multiple arguments. The first is that the COVID-19 public health crisis requires that the court uh, reopen the defendant's detention hearing and order his release to best ensure his well-being and the health of the public at large. That um, argument was made both um, verbally today and also in writing. The defendant cites NJSA 2A colon 162-19F and Rule 3 colon 4AB3, as well as NJSA 2A colon 162-21, uh, which the court um, uh, will discuss in greater detail later, the statutory application of the rule. The defendant also discussed in, in the brief and in oral argument today, the various actions taken by New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy in declaring a state of emergency in the public and public health emergency in connection with this matter. Um, counsel um, for the defense um, notes very ably during her argument that circumstances have changed on every side since the um, initial briefs were written. Numbers are changing, situations are changing. And I will even note for purposes of this argument, my um, familiarity with the executive order, which um, Governor Murphy issued over the weekend, which 
pertain to certain state prison inmates as well. Um, the defense also discussed in the pleadings that the World Health Organization has declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic and that there are certain actions um, taken by the Center for Disease Control and um, statements that were made by that agency included in the brief, and I'm familiar with those. And um, the defense also in the brief discussed the theory that conditions of pretrial confinement create an ideal environment for the transmission of contagious diseases, um, that inmates live in close proximity, have little access to hand sanitizer, and even less ability to frequently wash hands. Uh, defense counsel raises an oral argument concerns that she has regarding the clothing that the defendant wears and that other inmates wear. Um, and she notes also um, that there is a particular risk presented by those who have the virus but are asymptomatic. And the court understands that argument to include not just other inmates, but also corrections officers and others who will be interacting regularly with people um, in the jail. The defendant argues that circumstances have substantially and gravely changed since the defendant was originally ordered to be detained. And the defendant argues and, and cites a case at the Eastern District of New York that Courts have noted that there is no greater necessity than keeping a defendant alive, no matter what the charge that defendant faces is. Counsel argues again um, orally today and also in writing that the court needs to be mindful of the presumption of innocence and that Mr. Smith has not been convicted of any of the charges that he faces. Defendant argues that even those detained on the most serious of crimes um, should be considered for release, and she reiterates that defendants' arguments are not classified as violent. Um, she also argues that the defendant will be required to self-quarantine and comply with the present state of New Jersey orders, that is, executive orders um, and other directives regarding how individuals must comport themselves um, in terms of living their personal lives. And the argument is that risk posed by release defendants is at an all-time minimal level because of these new rules in New Jersey. No matter what we call it, the argument is that defendant would essentially be on home confinement. And the court is urged to reconsider um, the previous orders and um, will reopen the detention hearing for combinations of reasons which go to the defendant's safety the safety of those in the Mercer County Jail, the city the jail staff and issues associated with um, the corrections officers um, need to protect the safety of the public at large and to um, minimize the potential use of hospital resources. And the argument made today is that an incarcerated defendant who has to be taken to the hospital diverts important resources from both the county jail and also potentially from the hospital. The theory is that an incarcerated defendant who needs a ventilator is as entitled to a ventilator as anybody else, and you may be able to avoid the need for that if certain defendants are released from the county jail. And of course, the defense argues this morning the, um, that the defendant's family has been unfortunately affected in a very significant way um, by COVID-19, um, that uh, Mr. Smith's grandmother um, has been hospitalized, and certainly the court wishes her the best as, as she fights um, um, this virus. The state's argument is that the defendant has not shown that information exists that was not known by the prosecutor or the defendant at the time of the initial detention hearing, and that inform and also that that information has material bearing on the issue of detention pursuant to NJSA 2A colon 162-19F and rule 3 colon 4A B3. The state further argues that the court should not consider the temporary release of defendant as contemplated by NJSA 2A colon 162-21B. The state makes it clear that there is no disagreement as to the severity of the global pandemic. The state does not appear to challenge the general reliability of many of the declarations which were prepared by various doctors and submitted with the defendant's brief. 
Rather, the state argues that the court needs to adhere to the statutes and rules which define and implement the Criminal Justice Reform Act. The state argues that there's no new information which would undermine Judge Scully's conclusion that the defendant needed to be detained. There's no new information which would undermine Judge Bingham's determination on the motion to reopen. And the state also notes that the defendant is 30 with no identified health problems and that his argument for release is a general one which could be made by any inmate um, anywhere, anytime. The court first addresses the argument that the detention hearing should be reopened consistent with NJSA 2A colon 162-19F and rule 3 colon 4AB3. That statute provides in relevant part that the detention hearing may be reopened at any time before trial if the court finds that information exists that was not known to the prosecutor or the eligible defendant at the time of the hearing and that has a material bearing on the issue of whether there are conditions of release that will reasonably assure the eligible defendant's appearance in court when required, the protection of the safety of any other person or the community, or that the eligible defendant will not obstruct or attempt to obstruct the criminal justice process. The court has reviewed State versus Hippolyte, H-Y-P-P-O-L-I-T-E, 236-NJ-154-2018, which requires courts to use a modified materiality standard to decide whether to reopen uh, the hearing when exculpatory evidence is disclosed after a detention hearing. If there is a reasonable possibility that the result of the detention hearing would have been different had the evidence been disclosed, the hearing should be reopened. Um, Hippolyte um, at page 158. The burden is on the state to demonstrate that a new hearing is not required under the Hippolyte standard, and that's Hippolyte at 170. The situation before the court now is clearly not a situation where exculpatory evidence was disclosed after the detention hearing. I've already discussed the public safety assessment and the defendant's prior criminal history, as well as the strength of the case against the defendant. There is no new case-specific fact-based reason to reopen detention under NJSA 2A colon 162-19F. Um, and the, the fact is that the um, notwithstanding the global COVID-19 pandemic, the decision of Judge Scully and the decision of Judge Bingham are as correct today as the day they were made. Um, the conclusion that the defendant needs to be detained to ensure his appearance at trial and more importantly to protect um, the public remain valid. So the application to release pursuant to NJSA 2A colon 162-19F and the um, court rule um, which mirrors that, um, is denied. The defendant also seeks temporary re release pursuant to NJSA 2A colon 162-21B, which provides that the court may, by subsequent order, permit the temporary release of the eligible defendant subject to the appropriate uh, restrictive conditions, which may include, but shall not be limited to, pretrial supervision to the extent that the court determines um, the release to be necessary for the preparation of the um, eligible defendant's defense or for other compelling reasons. Um, the defendant's argument is not that the defendant needs to be released because it is necessary for the preparation of the defense, but rather that release is necessary for another compelling reason. And that, of course, is the global COVID-19 pandemic and the risks that go to the defendant's health from the defendant remaining in the Mercer County Jail, and also to the concerns which were identified before, that is the corrections officers, the general public, the hospital personnel, medical personnel, um, the safety of those who are in the Mercer County Jail, um, the protection of scarce hospital resources, all of those arguments um, were brought together under um, this umbrella. Um, and the um, defendants um, characterizes the change of circumstances here as substantial and grave. 
and reminds the court again, as I said before, of the presumption of innocence and that the defendant's offenses are not classified as violent. And I've certainly considered those things. And I've also considered here that the defendant is 30 years old and that he has not identified a specific health condition that makes him more vulnerable um, than anyone else. The state points out also that the defendant does not define what temporary release would mean in the context of this case. And um, the defendant is asking essentially to be released on an open-ended basis, presumably reserving the right to argue that he um, should not go back in ever at all um, on this. The, um, there really isn't any case law in New Jersey which deals um, with this um, matter. The, um, there have been some federal courts that have addressed this issue, um, uh, some in the Third Circuit. In on or about April 1, 2020, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit noted in a footnote that COVID-19 was an insufficient basis to grant release. U.S. versus Roeder, R-O-E-D-E-R, number 20-1682, 2020, U.S. app, um, Lexis, 10246, um, at what I believe is page 8 and footnote um, 16 where the court noted the existence of some health risk to every federal prisoner as a result of this global pandemic does not, without more, provide the sole basis for granting release to each and every prisoner within our circuit. There's another federal case out of the United States District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania, United States versus Thomas, uh, 2020 U.S. District Court, Lexus 55680, Western District of Pennsylvania, March 31, 2020. And in that case, the defendant also sought temporary release under a federal statute. He was detained on a drug case. Um, similarly, in that case, because he had not overcome the presumption of the community and the risk of flight. And I note that opinion did deal with a presumption um, as opposed to this case. But the, um, and I know there was a presumption of release in this case. The Federal court rejected the defendant's claim, recognized the potential for exposure to um, COVID-19, but also um, felt that the jail and other local authorities had taken the necessary steps and precautions to help stop the spread of COVID-19 amongst the population of uh, the jail. Um, and the court further noted that speculation regarding possible future conditions did not constitute a compelling reason um, for temporary release. The, um, there's another case, United States uh, versus Bastianelli, um, 2020 U.S. District Lexus 53441, also out of the Western District of Pennsylvania. And the court ruled similarly there that the arguments for release did not outweigh the factors considered by the court in its initial decision um, to detain. And the court there also noted that precautions and mitigation measures were in place to prevent the spread of the virus in the jail, that the virus at that point hadn't been detected in inmates or jail personnel who had direct contact with the inmates, and that the defendant did not have any medical condition which placed him at higher risk for contracting COVID. Now, of course, those facts are not completely online with what we have here. And I think both counsel agree that what we have here in this particular case um, has changed, has modified um, since the um, um, pleadings were filed in here. This is a very fluid situation and things are changing every day. Uh, United States versus Lovings, 2020 U.S. District Court, Lexus uh, 54607, Western District of Pennsylvania, March 30, 2020, was another case where a court rejected a motion for reconsideration of detention. And that involved a defendant who argued because of his age, which was 67, that he was particularly vulnerable. But even there, the court found that he failed to present any evidence of a separate personal health condition that would make him uniquely susceptible to COVID-19. Um, and courts around the country have decided motions to reopen detention in similar fashion. And again, I'm still speaking about federal courts, um, United States versus Clark. 2020 U.S. District, Lexus 51390, 
um, out of Kansas, March 25, 2020. Um, and that was a situation where the defendant um, had was a diabetic and the um, court still did not find a circumstances compelling enough to order release. United States versus Penaloza, 2020 U.S. District Lexus 56569, District of Maryland, um, March 31, 2020, denied the defendant's motion for reconsideration of pretrial detention as his arguments for release mainly consisted of speculation concerning his exposure to COVID-19, and he could not show how his heart murmur condition placed him at um, increased risk. Um, United States versus Wilson, 2020 U.S. District uh, Court Lexus 52755. The COVID-19 pandemic did not justify releasing the defendant, especially considering the danger he posed to the community. Um, United States versus Green, 2020 U.S. District Lexus 56301. Um, and that's from March 26, 2020. Um, out of Florida, I think, and the defendant there was not entitled to temporary release because of the pandemic, because he was 24 years old, in good health, and the court felt that no combination of release conditions could ensure the safety of um, the um, community. Now, there is a case um, where a contrary result um, was reached, and that's um, state for United States versus Stevens. Um, it's um, out of the Southern District of New York. And the um, site for that is Lexus 47846, Southern District, March 19, 2020. And there a um, motion to reconsider was um, granted and the defendant's release was ordered um, with conditions. The um, And the court noted there that, that there had been new information um, which presented that undermined the court's initial determination that the defendant posed a danger to the community. The court noted there that the state's case had weakened considerably since the initial detention hearing. And the court did uh, emphasize the unprecedented and extraordinarily dangerous nature of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it did consider um, the um, effect of the, the COVID-19 pandemic on inmates. But it, it also was very clear that the court felt that the weight of the evidence had shifted as well, and that was much more in the defendant's belief, uh, de defendant's um, benefit than it had earlier um, been. And the court there also considered um, access to counsel as an important um, thing. So clearly it appears that uh, from what I can tell from, from federal research, is that the COVID-19 pandemic by itself is not a sufficient justification um, to warrant um, release. Um, the age in and of itself, existing medical conditions in and of themselves are not dispositive. This is a young defendant, um, and there is no identified um, medical condition. There were very real fears and concerns that have been very well identified and very well argued, but they are general and not specific. And um, there is a, a speculative element um, to them. And um, the, the court has to remain mindful of the purpose of New Jersey's Criminal Justice Reform Act. And the court knows that uh, there was, as I said a moment ago, a legal presumption of this defendant's release pending trial, and that the presumption um, was overcome in this case. The defendant was detained for two separate reasons, the need to assure his appearance in court and the need to protect the public. Nothing presented to this court constitutes the um, statutorily contemplated compelling reason which would overcome the vital need to protect the public. Both the state and the defendant quote state public uh, defender Joe Krikora um, in their pleadings and Mr. Krikora acknowledged that any effort to get inmates out of jail because of the pandemic had to proceed under the premise um, that release could not in any way threaten the public safety and um, that the, the need to protect the public is an important um, linchpin of the court's decision in this matter. The, 
defense has uh, provided the court with a copy of the consent order um, here. Um, docket number 0842 um, Note um, parenthetically my familiarity with the consent order as I was one of the judges designated um, statewide to do the hearings where agreement could not be reached on um, certain of those cases. The consent order emanated from an order to show cause which was designed to um, uh, commute or suspend county jail sentences currently being served by county jail inmates either as a condition of probation for an indictable offense or because of a municipal court conviction. The parties agreed that the reduction of the county jail population under appropriate conditions was in the interest to mitigate risks that were posed by COVID-19. And the parties there included the Attorney General and the County Prosecutors Association of New Jersey. The release of certain such inmates was presumed unless the presumption was overcome uh, by a finding by a preponderance of the evidence that the release of the inmate would pose a significant risk to the safety of the inmate or the public. And the consent order also contemplated keeping in defendants who posed significant risk uh, to the safety of, of the public. The consent order, while it's important historical information, it's important for the court to understand um, what it is that's happened in the past regarding other cases, just as I mentioned, Governor Murphy issued another um, executive order over the weekend. Um, the fact is that the consent order does not apply um, to Mr. Smith's um, case. The um, conditions at um, the Mercer County Correction Center, obviously, this is a concern. It is a, a very real concern. Um, things have evolved, though I don't know precisely and exactly how. Since Warden Ellis submitted his certification, um, things evolve on a daily basis. Um, Governor holds news briefings every day, um, notes changes in, um, for example, the number of diagnosed cases in New Jersey. It's reasonable to assume that the jail situation changes on a daily basis, too. And I reviewed the certification of Warden Charles Ellis, um, and when it was written, there was an acknowledgement that one corrections officer had tested positive for COVID-19. And the court proceeds under the assumption at this point that um, the Mercer County Correctional Center may not remain free of the COVID virus. Um, and the court has to rely on the professional management of the correctional center, that they will be adaptable and that they will implement new procedures um, as those procedures um, become required. Um, and I think the county jail has shown its good faith and its willingness um, to do that. But for the reasons which I've discussed, I also don't see um, that it is appropriate to consider temporary release um, pursuant to NJSA 2A colon 162-21B either. I don't find that that compelling reason has um, been demonstrated. The fact is, while I understand that the PSA classifies um, uh, the particular offenses here as nonviolent, I am aware of the no release recommended um, position the PSA took a statement the PSA made that he was a six on the FTA scale, a five on the NCA scale. I know what his prior criminal history was, and I understand the facts of this case, and I understand what the defense um, argument is in terms of the limitations that are associated with this matter.